What's happening, friends? Welcome to another episode of our monthly interview series. It is called IGN Unfiltered. My name is Ryan McCaffrey, and my guest this week, Dennis Dyack. If you don't necessarily know his name, you will know his resume for sure. Let's go through it. So currently, Dennis, the CEO of Apocalypse Studios. We'll talk about your new game, Dead House Sonata, later on in this interview. But Silicon Knights, that yes. is uh, where I think most of our audience will know you from. Your resume has Blood Omen Legacy of Cain on it. Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem on it. Metal Gear Solid, Twin Snakes on it. Two Human on there. X-Men Destiny, it is, a, it is quite a roster. Thank you so much for joining me, Dennis. Thanks for having me. So there's a lot to talk about. You, uh, you've been an outspoken guy in your career. You've been, a, you've, you've been uh, a prominent developer with Microsoft, with Nintendo, on the PC, PlayStation. You, you've, you know everyone, you've done yeah. it all. And what, so I just, I always like to start, I always like to just go back and we'll go like the sure. Batman Begins origin story here. Sure. When did you fall down the well and the bats attacked you? Like, what, what drew you to games as a kid? So uh, I really started uh, paying attention to games uh, way, I guess, really early on when I was younger and I was playing Ultima. And uh, there was this game, Ultima 3, which goes way, way back. A uh, huge uh, fan of RPGs and uh, I was playing Ultima 3 and I was stuck. I was at, my party was in a boat and there was this whirlpool that was going around and I didn't know where to go. I was uh, stuck essentially. Yeah. I explored everything and the ship, I wasn't paying attention. I was super tired. Uh, the ship got sucked into the whirlpool and I got really angry. I thought everyone was dead. And then boom, it opened up a new world. And I, I, that whole moment of how I felt at that point, I realized at that point, that I wanted to do that, yeah. have that, ex give that experience to other people. That's cool. So you can, that's such, I love that you can trace it back to a specific moment in a specific exactly game. Exactly that time. Yeah. Have you had the opportunity in your career to speak to Richard Garriott about yes. that? Yes. Um, so I've spoken to him uh, a little, not as much as other people that I know. And um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of his games. Um, and uh, he's a he's a really good guy, but we've never I've never had a chance to like sit down and have a coffee. And as we're talking now, it's been like at a show where he's super busy, so it's been hey, I'm Dennis. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I know some of your stuff, and that was it. So oh, we got to fix that. I would love to. I would yeah, love to. Sit I, down I think I can. Have, like I don't have a lot of power in this industry, but I know <laughs> Richard was in here. He did the really? show. Oh wow. He told me a bunch of a million great stories. You should wow. check that episode out. Actually, oh, well. he's been to space, as you probably I know. I do know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think I can facilitate. I would. I would love to sit down. He's, with he's a great guy. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. So. Um, you, that, that answers my next question, which is, you know, the bug bit you right there because you focused on computer science in That's college. Right. So you, you had, you were locked in and you knew what, what you wanted to do. Well, it's kind of a strange story. Not, not, not really at first. So, um, so at that point, that was when I was in high school and I was taking a few computer courses. But I, my, when I went to university, um, I was on the varsity wrestling team, and um, a lot of people don't know this, but I was a full contact Canadian Taekwondo champion. Wow. I was into a lot of physical sports, and uh, I went to university, to a university called Brock University in Niagara. They have the best wrestling team in Canada. They've won uh, the Canadian championships for like 25 years in a row wow. or something. So I went there to wrestle. So my first degree was in phys ed. Okay. And I was still playing video games, but I just wanted to wrestle. And so I was into a lot of contact sports. I went from like different types of martial arts to wrestling. And as I was graduating from phys ed, I really had uh, sort of career choices to make. Um, I could have become a teacher, which a lot of phys ed teachers, a lot of phys ed graduates do. I could have went into pharmaceuticals because, you know, you take a lot of physiology and sure. stuff, right? And the other one was uh, I applied to the RCMP um, and got accepted. And I looked at all those and I just started dating my wife now, Joanne. And um, a good friend of mine said, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I just want to make video games. And, and, the, and he was like, well, why don't you make video games? And I was like, I'm not confident. I don't think I know. I don't have the tools. I've got all these ideas, but I don't think I'm smart enough to make games. And he goes, well, go into computer science. And I was like, I don't think I'm smart enough for computer science. And he really uh, said, don't let anyone tell you you can't do something. So I went into computer science and my average, it's different, it's not the same as in the US, so I'll just give percentages. Yeah. I was like, I guess a 72, 75 average in phys ed. Okay. 
but I graduated high honors, like wow. 92 plus uh, in computer science. So I did really well in computer science. And then just as I, and I made my first game as we were doing, uh, as I was doing my undergraduate, I then started my master's in computer science and artificial intelligence, neural networks and user interfaces. Wow. And then- You found I, your calling. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. And I felt then empowered. Um, and uh, I learned a ton of lessons. And with that computer science degree in my pocket, there were no video game courses back then. There was no such thing. Right. And even back then, it wasn't even clear if there was uh, a video game industry because don't forget, I'm in Canada. There's not, there wasn't Silicon Valley. So with our first game, I literally flew out here hoping I'd find a video game industry. And our first game was published, which was called... Uh, Cyber, Cyber em Empires. Cyber Empires. Ask you about it. Yeah. yeah, and it it actually won multiplayer game of the year by Computer Gaming World before there was an internet. So it was a hot seat. It was very much like uh, the Total War series, and except it was a hot seat game where you played on a wrist board and then the fighting would occur in real time. So I've always liked the Total War series too, but this was obviously way before. And uh, that's how it all started. Wow. So I'm curious, is unrelated to the game stuff. Did did the did did your martial arts training make you a better wrestler, and vice versa? Did those did those uh, yeah, complement yeah. each other? Especially, you know, especially a lot, believe it or not, a lot of my friends went into mixed martial arts just as it started exploding. Yeah. So a lot of the sort of early champions were a lot of them are wrestlers. I knew them all, <laughs> um, and um, it did translate. And and frankly, it translated to video games too. Uh, despite what everyone might think, it, it's really tough to make games. You go through a lot of punishment. And those people who know me, I've had some extreme highs and some very deep lows. And getting through that takes a lot of, uh, just a lot of focus on this is what you want to do. And um, it's a tough, tough industry. So um, yeah. So Silicon Knights, you start that at 26, you're 26 years old, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned Cyber Empires. Was sort of, you mentioned what it is, but what do you remember about that game? Like either, like a something you learned that you from in the process of actually making something that that your studies never prepared you for, or just kind of what 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 about that project? Like the first first thing that comes to mind about that project when I mention it. Um, it was purely fueled by exuberance and excitement for the industry. And um, we just, I guess that's where the, I guess what I would call my first golden rule of making games really got solidified. And um, what the golden rule is uh, for me, when you're making video games, you never know if you're gonna please anyone. So a lot of people will say, do this, this, this is the market that's going to be hot. And if you're at GDC now, you hear all of this stuff, right? And the noise is insane. So what I learned was if you make a game that you like yourself, you're guaranteed to please at least one person. And that generally, that love for that game will come through in what you're making. Yeah. So in Cyber Empires, when we won that award that came out of nowhere, I didn't know anyone at Computer Gaming World. I had no contact with the West Coast. I was like blown away. I was like, oh, we won an award. And I, it's one of those things where it was so neat and the industry was so new. I remember showing my mother that and I said, said to her, she read the article and she took it and so she hit me over the back of the head with it. And I said, I was like, what happened? Why are you hitting me with this magazine? And she, she's like, you said you're from St. Catharines, which is in Niagara, where I'm from. And she goes, you're not from St. Catharines, you're from Meriton, which is a small principality that got <laughs> absorbed into St. Catharines. And uh, I don't even refer to St. Catharines anymore. I really think that Niagara should be one city uh, and uh, no one really knows St. Catharines when you talk about it here on the West Coast, but they know Niagara. Yeah. And that was that's what I remember from getting that. That was what one. your mom took away. That's from what it. my mom took away from it, and I was like, oh god. So um, yeah, that's that's those are some of the things that I remember from Cyber Empires. It was a, a really good time. We had no idea what we were doing, but the passion led to the finish. Yeah, which I think is still consistent to what I do today. And did you get? Uh, did CGW send you a trophy? Did you guys get a trophy too? Yes, I yeah. think so. I think so. Um, it's, it's going to sound really Where terrible. is it now? I've lost a lot. Oh, of them. I, I, I used to have a trophy case, but um, there's there was like a ton of as, as you, if you're in this industry for a while and you do all right, you know, you get a lot of these and I've, I've lost a lot of them. So <laughs> I know it's terrible. Oh, that's that terrible. is a shame. Yeah, that's yeah. a shame. All right. 
Uh, so then let's let's fast forward a little bit to to Legacy of Cain, yep. Blood Omen, Legacy of Cain. Mm -hmm. That was. I think maybe you disagree. I don't know. But that that was the breakthrough game, yeah, right? Absolutely, that was the breakthrough game. So, what do you remember about that game? Did you and when do you know you've got something great? Is it not till after it comes out, or is it sometime during the development process where you're like, we we got something here? Uh, it's really so you have this feeling when you talk to people. There's this resonance, and it's it's never. It's never something you can put your, your hand on or something that you can touch and feel. There's no metrics you can go, this is a guaranteed hit. But there's that feeling that you have by people talking to you. And um, so I remember all kinds of showing people all kinds of things on the show floor at E3. This is yeah. back when you'd show things before they were done. And <laughs> this is way, way back. This is like, it actually might not have even been E3. It might have been CES back in right. the times when Vegas. things were. Yeah, or yeah, Chicago. We, yeah. So, uh, the one story I remember about Legacy of Cain was there was these bunch of uh, uh, bunch of uh, people were coming by, but then this uh, uh, Japanese person came by and he started asking me questions, and I started answering and like I'll talk and this went on for half hour to forty five minutes. Wow! Right, and I'm like, okay, okay, and then uh, you know he walked away, said thank you very much, and he goes, what's your name, Dennis? And I said what we're doing, and so he walked away, and then. Four other people came over and like, you know who that was? And I was like, no. And they go, that's Mr. Arakawa. And uh, he uh, runs a Nintendo of America. And I was like, <laughs> I knew very little about the console industry at right. that point because the PlayStation was my first. Like, I obviously loved Nintendo, but I was like, oh, cool. And that's when I started thinking this could be a good game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it's 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 one of those things where um, we made. Um, we were the only, so back then, so here's what I believe about Legacy of Kane. And I guess when, even with Dead House Sonata now, uh, why I'm going back to, I think my roots with Legacy of Kane. Legacy of Kane, I studied the medium a lot. And people will say, well, what does that mean? I'm a huge Marshall McLuhan fan. The medium is the message. And back then, when the PlayStation came out, for the first time, we had this technology called a CD-ROM. where 650 megabytes. That's right, that's right. And, but it allowed you, before then it was all cartridge. That's right. And I love playing RPGs, and I'm an avid reader. I hated reading on a television. Yeah. It was really blocky, it hurt your eyes, and I was like, wow, we can actually put voice on this so people don't have to read. And if you look at Legacy of Cain, and people don't necessarily remember, there's no text anywhere. It's mm -hmm. all voiceover. And so that, studying the medium, I think really helped that game break out. And that's what I remember. There's a couple things about Legacy of Cain that I remember the most that resonate with me personally, is we were able to tell stories in a different way that people were used to. Not only was there an anti-hero where you're the vampire, the world hates you, and you're the only one who can save the world, but the way that we were able to tell the story hadn't really been done before because that medium didn't exist. And um, the other thing was I started looking at what made that game successful and I started thinking about engagement theory. Why was Kane, uh, why did it stand out? What made Kane special? There was a lot of introspection there because um, that was our first RPG. Before yeah. then we were doing real-time strategy games, right? And um, that, help me, I guess, divide, create a compass for what games I wanted to create in the future. So those Legacy of Cain is a huge watermark for, for myself personally and will always have a special place in my heart. So. Now, uh, the great Amy Hennig mm -hmm. worked on that project. Yes. Uh, and so what, what do you, uh, did you, did you learn a lot from her and vice versa? So it's, it's such a strange thing. So, um, this is going to, it'll probably shock you. And I've, I've seen some interviews. I don't know if it's the one uh, that you did at Dice, but I've seen some things um, at previous conferences. So when Amy came on board, it wasn't in a story capacity at all. She was, an, I was, she was introduced to me as an art manager. Hmm. And um, so she, I, I liked her. I liked working with her. And I think, so she came on the project where Legacy of Kane, it was ending. So she had just joined Crystal. And by the time the project finished, I think that's when she became a design director. Yeah. So her role changed as we were there, but she was in California and we were in Niagara working on the game. Right. And she oversaw some of the game designers that came and worked with us at 
in Niagara and stuff. And you know, we went over the story and we 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 talked about a lot of things, but it was more at the design and art level, and not the story at that point was pretty much set. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so seeing her change and seeing her uh, really come into her own in storytelling was very interesting. And so we talked a lot about theory and story, and I had no idea she was going to go in that direction. And we, I guess, were very similar in the ways that we think story is important, but we also come at it from two different schools of thought. I think um, she's uh, very traditional in the sense of, um, this is you know my opinion, and I hope she doesn't get upset. Uh, but it's not it's not negative. It's um, she comes at it from a, a very uh, traditional character focused perspective, where uh, you look at poetics. Uh, every character that has a line in the story has to mean something. I come at it from a, a world building perspective, so uh, that's not traditional, and it's not necessarily three acts. And you really build the world first. It's a very sort of Tolkien-esque approach or a Babylon 5 approach where the world is almost more important than the characters. Right. And they, those are very different approaches, but they can result in the same things. And when she took over the Legacy of Cain stories afterwards, like I saw the shift, um, but the gamers didn't and they loved it. And it was just great to see that that continued. And so um, I haven't spoken to her now for three or four years, and I want to catch up with her as well. It's been, a, and I, I understand that I think she's at Google now. Um, is that correct? She's been playing around with uh, some VR stuff, and yeah, she's she seems to be kind of waiting to see what her what her what she wants to do next. From from what I could get, I could be wrong, but I it's <laughs> rumors. We're at GDC right now, in case people are wondering when this is shooting. But um, I thought she is now at Google. Maybe but I, could be I wrong. don't know. That could be news to me yeah, as well. It, it's but. a rumor. It's a rumor. <laughs> anyway, I'd love to catch up. I think she's a great person, and it was really fun working with. Yeah, her. she. Uh, when I sat down with her, she she in the context of explaining what her Star Wars game was going to be at EA. Yeah, she completely deconstructed the Star Wars films to me in a way that was. So like smart and so simple oh, yeah. that I'd never even oh she's never very smart would have yeah, yeah. thought about it like sure. that yeah but um yeah have you so have you followed along with her career in the sense of have you played all the Uncharted games and and kept up with not just, all but a lot yeah and um I I love her work I think she does really cool stuff and um I look forward to seeing what she's doing next that's for sure all right so. Uh, we, we, we move forward a little bit so this is Dennis Dyack this is your life this is your career <laughs> sure so. Uh, I mean this in the nicest way possible, but Dennis, how does a studio in a quiet Canadian border town mm -hmm. hook up with Nintendo? That's a really so. It's a really good question. Um, I think um, I think because we were aligned so much in what we thought as development groups, and I'll, I'll tell the story, but let me explain some context of that first. There's really two schools of thought in the video game industry when it comes to making games and getting them out there. And the one approach is a very, uh, what I would consider a, a, a marketing-based company where they'll spend tons of money marketing a game and usually, potentially, multiples more than they'll spend on the development. Those are marketing-based. That's most of the video game industry sure. where the budgets will be, maybe it's 100 million for the game, and the, the, the marketing budget's 500 million, right? And they're, it's cr like this crazy numbers, right? Yeah, the Activision approach. Yeah, exactly. And Nintendo's very development focused. And we're completely development focused as well. And, you know, much easier to say for a developer. And so we, uh, right after Legacy of Kane, we had a tech demo for Two Human. And uh, Two Human uh, it used the same engine as Legacy of Kane, but I did one thing that was, I thought, I'm always looking at the medium. What can I do with the medium? How can I make it more seamless? And yeah. what, what different things with this new medium can I do? So back then, we had some cinemas that would seamlessly go into the top-down approach. So imagine Two Human in a Kane engine, so it was a 2D ISO that would the cinematics would seamlessly go into the game so there's no cuts. Oh, cool. Right, so we had that demo working. I was all excited. I was yeah. like, well, this is really cool. 
And Final Fantasy uh, VI, I think, is it VI, was announced, and that's when they started doing the seamless cinemas, and I was crushed. <laughs> I thought, well, we're going to be the first to do this, and then Final Fantasy is showing all their stuff at E3. But Nintendo um, was interested enough to say, well, clearly you didn't copy them because you're here at the same time. <laughs> and they started asking why I wanted to do that. And I think when I started talking about the medium and where I see the medium of video games going, they... Uh, I think it aligned with them. And so we started uh, very slowly and we had to work with them a long time, prove that we could do technology. At the time we were working on the N64. Yes. Um, and so we had to write a lot of 3D stuff. Um, and uh, for those who don't know, while we were working on Eternal Darkness with them, we got really, really far on Eternal Darkness with the N64. And then Nintendo made uh, the decision that they would stop making games on the N64 and everything had to go to the GameCube. We had to start over. That was, that was tough. That was tough. Um, a, lot, a lot of the team was uh, very upset, but in the end it was the right decision because the platform was really cool. I'm a huge GameCube fan. So yeah, so that's how that started. We That two human demo to them, not necessarily the game, but I think the approach we were taking to it uh, really uh, resonated with them. So, so I, I tell people all the time, for me, uh, I love Mario Sunshine. Mm. I love a lot of stuff. But for me, Eternal Darkness, I think, is the greatest GameCube game. Oh, I really you. do. It's my, it, it's, it's my favorite. I'll put it that way, at least. Um, so do you think, based on what you just told me, did I could absolutely see how it could be demoralizing to have to effectively start over after after doing a bunch of uh, god knows how much work on the gamecube or on the, on the n64 but did did that make eternal darkness a better game in the sense that you could did you have a chance to rectify any mistakes or reevaluate things and and have a chance to to you know make it again for the first time effectively well yeah so we had an opportunity to really look at, I think there's a, a lot of things with Eternal Darkness that really set it apart. You know, certainly one was the sanity system. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, another was the camera system. And if you remember at the time, all sort of, I guess, horror games were tank control. And what we did is we tried to do a seamless camera system that you didn't control, but sort of flowed like you'd see in a movie. And this was, you know, I, I think, God of War, Assassin's Creed, after after Eternal Darkness came out, they certainly looked at it and adopted a lot of our techniques. And I was lucky enough to, uh, I'm a big believer in academics, and we had two uh, tenured professors on staff at Silicon Knights. One uh, who's a really good friend of mine still, and who's now at Apocalypse, uh, Dr. Barry Grant, where him and I came up with a camera system, and we pitched it to Miyamoto-san and stuff, saying, oh, wow. this is where we think, because back then doing a third person camera was very tough and uh, there was a lot of push to go towards a first person camera and we uh, had this basically breakdown why it was important for story. So a lot of people don't know this, but film as it initially started was all first person. And then they started realizing by doing r shots on people's faces and showing emotion that you can relate more and it's better for storytelling. Yeah. So I was able to work with Barry and our Dr. Bear Grant, and uh, he was able to help me put together so solid, researched reasoning on why a third-person camera would be better for Eternal Darkness. And the GameCube, of course, was very fast, and we were able to do very smooth trans transitions and, of course, more powerful than the N64. So it was kind of like starting over, but we had a lot more polish time. Um, the only thing that sort of took it sideways was... Unfortunately, 9-11, where we had to rewrite a lot of the story. Eternal Darkness almost got canceled. Really? Because of 9-11. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What what in the story? Ref refresh me. Yeah. So uh, we had... Uh, it, was, it was very historically based, and we had a crusader in the game. And uh, back then, after 9-11, um, there was a lot of talk about a new crusade and... Uh, lots of like there was anthrax going through the mail and people were I like that. anything with sort of uh, Middle Eastern content people were like kill this game and so we had to rewrite it and just remove all of that stuff and there was nothing negative towards anyone it was just yeah, a just... historical perspective about a fantasy game but it so 
we would have made launch of of the end. Oh, that yeah, was of the, the goal. GameCube. Yeah, okay. no, we were on target, and but we had to rewrite several stories in the game and pull all that stuff out, and and um, that was uh, very very different. Uh, that was an experience, but. Um, I'm really happy to say is that all the people at Nintendo, you know, uh, Awata-san, I really miss him, uh, uh, Miyamoto-san, those guys care about good games, and they, I sat down with them, I was, I was in, I flew down to Japan for all this, and I just told them I think this game should be made, and they're like, why? And they're like, can you do this? Can you guarantee you'll pull all this content out? And we just went crazy and just pulled it all out, made sure it was safe. We had like a million like lawyers look at it. Sure. And, and uh, it was very tough, but in the end, it worked out. And uh, you know, I, I don't think the story stuff suffered. And um, and it, uh, you know, people remember it as uh, as it was intended. So it's it's good. It's good. It was a good experience. But it, it was pretty. It was pretty. Like I said, making video games very hard. <laughs> well, it sounds like there's a book to be written just about Eternal Darkness's development between the N64 yeah. and then the 911 stuff. And yeah. Yeah. What a, what a road that was. But yeah. Boy, I, you can really be proud of of what oh, what came out you. of it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I am. I, I think. Um, I think there's so many good memories there, and um, unlike uh, I, I've been really lucky with the opportunities I, I've been given, um, you know, to have a chance to work with you know Miyamoto-san and Nintendo, and you know, look, Legacy of Kain when we created it, we that was our first story-driven game. We were just like, let's go do this, and we just happened to bump into the right people to yeah. have it align, and you know. Um, you know, I was just I was just saying the other I was just in a we were just talking and like I got when we finished Legacy of Kane, I got a chance to meet Phil Harrison, who was, you know, uh, at the time moved on more, to Xbox. Yeah. Well, well no, he was at Sony at the at time. At the time, yeah. At the time, and then he moved on to Xbox right. and now he's at Google. Yeah. And um it's just so funny because we were talking about all these things and you know, you get a chance to do these things and um it's really a hard industry, but it's you, you look back and you're just like, wow, these were just amazing opportunities. And it really it really makes me excited. And Eternal Darkness, we have, uh, you know, a lot of people saying, this was my favorite game. Please make another one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's 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 just it feels really good as a developer for people to want to do that. And, you know, even Legacy of Cain. Um, on our YouTube channel, I don't know if you've seen it, but we did an interview with sort of super hardcore Legacy of Kane fans who deconstructed an early alpha build to find lost content. <laughs> and um, so they did. They called us up and said, hey, can we ask you questions about the build? And I was like, it's 20 years ago, but sure. <laughs> and it's it's uh, it was good, it's fun. So, so, it, so uh, t the content aside, the, the content that you had to cut from Eternal Darkness aside, mm -hmm. Would would you have rather been a, a launch title for GameCube, or or were you happy with kind of coming out a little a little into it with a with an installed base? Yeah, you're gonna find with me. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the way things have gone in general. Um, so I I wouldn't want to change anything. It, things you know obviously that was out of our control. Sure. Um, and I think the ability to you know make those changes and uh, you know I guess. Uh, diversify under uh, conditions that you don't expect it you'll ever be faced with uh, is a testament to uh, the game concept itself is solid and um, so we were able to work around it. so no I wouldn't change anything um, you know we certainly at that point got a reputation for always being late and I, I don't know how bad that is so it's just sort of like uh, well you, know, you got Miyamoto's famous saying right yeah yeah. A, a bad game is bad forever. That that literally we put we had a, we had a poster of yeah. the Silicon Knights that had that up there because yeah. um, it was it was really it was really tough because back then and Eternal Darkness was very much anticipated by you know the Nintendo fans and the fact that we had to delay it by several months there was some uh, unhappy unhappy people so well one one more Eternal Darkness question yeah, yeah for, sure, on, for, sure, for sure I'm just curious so uh, you, you you touched on it but. Um, probably the signature element of Eternal Darkness, among it being a great game overall, were the was the sanity meter and the yeah. the sanity effects. So uh, you're you're breaking the fourth wall. You're doing all kinds of cool stuff. Testing your memory, did were there any of those that were really cool that that hit the cutting room floor that didn't make it into the game for one reason or another? Uh, no, actually. Um... Now there were some ones that were almost got cut, and that we uh, again 
sat down, literally sat down with Mr. Miyamoto and uh, many of the crew at, uh, you know, NCL and that made it in that made me so happy but they were extremely dangerous but what it showed to me is how much nintendo cares about their consumers like as game developers i think we work for gamers that's that is rule number one yeah um and so the particular sanity effect that i'm referencing here is the one where it starts deleting your memory card yeah. really slowly. So that was my personal favorite. I sat down and made sure that 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 sort of meter went really slow enough for people to start screaming. And I could see how Nintendo might freak out a little bit on that one. Well, there's a good reason, and I hadn't <laughs> thought about it right because I'm a game developer. I'm like, ah, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> and um, they're like, so Mr. Miyamoto sat down with a bunch of engineers and said, Dennis, what if someone looks at that, gets really angry? and throws their uh, you know, GameCube against the wall because they think it's bugged out. <laughs> and he goes, is that our fault? And I caught, it caught me. I, didn't, I was like, I don't know, may, maybe. And he goes, well, what do we have to do for customer service for that? Have you thought of that? And I was like, <laughs> I haven't. He goes, have you ever seen anything like this before? And I was like, no. And he goes, well, what do you think? And I think, I, I said, I think because you're saying, have you ever seen this before? That we should do it because I don't think anyone has done nice. it before. And he sat back and everyone looked around and they're like, we think this is very risky, but we'll do it. And that's what I remember the most. With Eternal Darkness, we pushed a lot of barriers. Like Eternal Darkness was not a typical Nintendo game. Oh no. And, and when you look at the whole Lovecraftian mythos, it doesn't appear in any other Nintendo franchises, right? And um, the whole idea that they would walk down that road with us and think about it again talking about uh, babylon 5 multiple characters there's like 12 characters most of which die right and um that is not a typical game that comes out of nintendo and they were <laughs> on board so far to even you know with that example um and i had never considered uh that that possibility and um there's a lot of a lot of I think goodwill that went into that, and they were just they believe in gamers, and they and and I said to them, I think that experience will be th something that gamers will remember forever, and uh, yeah, so and that it, it, I think so, yeah, yeah, it's my favorite. So so today. how did how did Eternal Darkness do sales wise? Like did, did, it, like how did did it do very well? Uh, yeah, yeah, it it did sure deserve to. Well, it did well considering uh, the. Uh, numbers on the console and the gamecube which is one of my favorite consoles did not do well right. compared to other consoles yeah so if you look at uh what we call penetration rates our number of sales for the number of consoles out there it yeah. did well um however the because the gamecube did not sell as much as say the, the switch has rate, yeah. or anything right so it was the lowest selling console it didn't break a million units it got close but um, which was unfortunate, and um, but I think it resonated really well with the Nintendo crowd. So was it? So Legacy of Kane sold more, um, and at the same time, which is great. But I think in many ways, Eternal Darkness really had a strong resonance within the Nintendo community, and many people have said to me, "That's my favorite, you know, GameCube game of all time," and some have said of you know Nintendo game of all time. And so though it didn't do the numbers. Um, maybe I'm happy to say it's kind of like a Blade Runner. Like Blade Runner is my favorite film of all time. Yeah. It did not do massive box office numbers. Right. I don't care. Um, I just look at it as like, what did it do um, as a uh, an achievement? And you know, I think I think it I think it changed the way people thought about video games, which is important to me. So who? Does Nintendo own it? Yes. So yes. They, they've got it. Uh, yes. Have you have you talked to them? I mean, you, oh, we'll talk a little later about you know you, there was there was uh, your your spiritual successor. Yeah. That yeah. You, you tried to, the, the, but uh, have, I mean, it sounds like it was a good process with Nintendo, and Amazing. they they really believed in you, and you Amazing. believed in them, and well, why have why haven't <laughs> Has <laughs> this game come back around? Well, there's a either couple... from you or even from somebody else potentially if they well, own it. Well, there's, there's there's a bunch of stories related to that. So the first one is a lot of people are always asking, well, why did you leave Nintendo? And um, I love Nintendo. I always will uh, love all the memories. And back in that time, it was when the Switch was coming out, and there was a 
complete shift within Nintendo to move away from deep RPGs and story-based games and move towards quick, uh, I would say, like party More games. More portable friendly. Stuff. Yeah, and um, that was the whole goal of Nintendo. And uh, they wanted us to make those kind of games too. And um, I didn't think that I could serve that role well. I loved, don't get me wrong, I loved Nintendo. They were always good with us. And I, I just, you know, being much younger than I am now, <laughs> certainly um, it was not the maybe the best business move, but I think from a creative standpoint, uh, I wanted to do another large story-driven game. And uh, it just didn't fit within the Nintendo world. And as much as I spoke with you know Mr. Miyamoto and Mr. Iwata, they were like, Dennis, you're, we love you, but you can't you do a game like this? And I'm like, I, I don't know how. I don't know if you even want me to make those games. And I go, my team's not built for it. And so we eventually, you know, separated ways, which was heartbreaking, I think, for everybody. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, there was no, like, uh, drama or fallout. Right. It was just, uh, the, we, Nintendo was going in a certain corporate direction. Now, if I would have been much smarter and much older, I would have realized that eventually they're going to come back because they're Zelda, <laughs> yeah. and they have, right? So they're 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 doing the hardcore games again, and it's just like ah. Um, so I guess it, uh, a, 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 maybe an older, wiser Dennis would say, you know, wait it out for eight years, and it'll all come back, <laughs> which it has. Um, and uh, so, so the door yeah. could still be open. You never. Know. Oh, I would always love to work with <laughs> Nintendo, <laughs> and I've got a lot of good friends there. And um, you know, I don't. Um, so with Eternal Darkness. Um, a lot of people don't know this. As, as uh, Silicon Knights uh, was uh, slowly dying, uh, we were in the process of getting the rights back. And um, so, but it never completed. Yeah. So uh, when you look at Precursor and the Spiritual Successor, um, there were still even back then potential negotiations going on, but you know it obviously never happens, so, right? Which was unfortunate. Well, uh, another the other game that you did with Nintendo before that uh, partnership faded away was uh, was of course Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. Mm -hmm. Did do you get to work directly with Kojima much on that? Is he <laughs> yeah. super hands on with something like that? Or um, no, he was hands. So well, the story I think tells the clearest picture from a perspective of. Um, we just finished Eternal Darkness. It's, I remember all this because it was in the summertime. It was my birthday. I had my birthday. Uh, my birthday is July 24th, so I was at Nintendo uh, getting the Eternal Darkness. I just finished. We're getting you know all the all this stuff. People are super happy with it. Um, and I'm sitting down and we're talking about our next projects and what they're going to be. And I'm thinking it's probably going to be too human. We'll talk. And then uh, there's a large cafeteria at NCL. And um, so I've been working with Mr. Miyamoto and Mr. Iwata for some time. And so Mr. Miyamoto, Mr. Miyamoto comes over and he starts eating sushi with me. And it's no big deal. So we're just talking. But then Mr. Iwata comes over and then everyone in the cafeteria is looking over. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, what's going on? And, they're, and so they're... Uh, they sit back and they say, hey, Dennis, uh, we're thinking about doing a Metal Gear Solid. Would you be interested in doing it? And I'm like, <laughs> so I almost choke on my food. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And um, they're, well, we've been talking with Mr. Kojima, and he's always wanted to work with us. And um, he wants to do a Metal Gear Solid game. And uh, unfortunately, he's working on Metal Gear Solid 3. He's too busy. And uh, I told him that I had a perfect team. And he goes, that team is you. And I went, what? <laughs> and he's like, do you want to do Metal Gear Solid? And I go, is this serious? And he's like, yes, this is very serious. Wow. Mr. Mr. And so they're like, yes, Dennis, this is serious. And I go, if you want me to do a Metal Gear, I'll do it. I said, I have no idea how this is going to go or what we're going to do. And he goes, that's okay. We've got a meeting tomorrow in Tokyo. We're all going on the bullet train. <laughs> and so we got on the bullet train and the deal was done. I again came from Japan home and told people we were doing Metal Gear Solid. And people were like, what are you talking <laughs> what, about? Dennis, what have you done? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, but there's another example of what an awesome experience, right? So I, I think we brought like 15 or 20 people to uh, uh, Konami headquarters in, in Tokyo, sat down with the team, everyone got to know everyone. We, we, we really you know, got to learn uh, Mr. Kojima's thought process on all of the stuff that he was doing. Yeah. And well, our job was to take the gameplay of Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2, put it in, make the game, and uh, you know, sort of work on you know, making something new while he was working on Metal Gear 3. So he visited the studio often. We had video conference calls all the time. So yeah, he's very hands-on. He's he's a great guy. And man, those guys, they work hard, 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 right? And um, so they're uh, always 
working towards perfection. And I think from a, a polished standpoint, I don't think anyone does anything more polished than him. He's way up there. It's certainly in the top, top 10 in the industry. And I would say like Eternal Darkness cinemas compared to his, uh, were uh, his cinemas were much more polished, and we learned a lot from that. I learned a lot, and how we did it, and is that was my next question: is what do you learn from Hideo Kojima? Oh, um, just uh, just how he will get things done, and not when often in this industry you'll hear this a lot from anyone. Not just like doing X is impossible, and I've never seen him like say I'm going to do this and not be able to solve that problem. And some of those problems are like steep hills. I'm like, well, yeah. how are we gonna do this? Like, there's even times at Metal Gear, I was like, how are we gonna do all this? And it all came together and it was just like, wow, okay. And uh, it was just a tremendous experience. So, all right, let's fast forward to, to Human, I think we're up to here. Yes, uh, how do you end up hooking up with Microsoft on that? Well, um, so that was literally from the previous conversations where I said, you know, with Nintendo, we didn't know how to do party games, and um, the same guys. So we have agents. Uh, we have we had agents at the time, and the agents that represented us and got us connected with Two Human. Right. Um, soon as we decided that, look, we we're going to go forward with Two Human. We don't think that fits within Nintendo. Unfortunately, Nintendo just wasn't uh, you know uh, wasn't the type of game they were looking for. Um, so we said, hey, we're going to have to take it to the market. Um, these guys were connected with everyone in the industry. And um, I guess, well, Microsoft was also in Seattle. They heard right away and that we had meetings really fast and it happened like super fast. They were like, we love this game. We want to do it. Let's go for it. And, and, and do they sign you? Like, do they, is it signed up as a trilogy straight away? Yes. So yes. Right, right away, you've got the pitch for three games yes. and they're, they're on board. I mean, they already had Mass Effect going, I guess. At that yes, point, which correct. was also planned as a trilogy. Yeah, yeah, and th they would they would talk about it as we have this other project that we can't talk about that's similar in nature but very different. And I had no idea what that was till Mass Effect was right. Announced. They're an RPG. You're more of an action game. Correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, so that was that was interesting stuff. And but I got I got to know the guys from Bioware really well uh, because of their relationship with Microsoft. So we hung out a lot together. Really liked those guys. So uh, fellow Canadians. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So it was supposed to be a trilogy, and I mean, what do you think happened there? Do you think you kind of put the cart before the horse, or what? What? No. Ultimately, uh, what happened with with Two Human? Well, the, the problem the problem was the engine, and um, we uh, before then uh, we had written all our own engines, and um, we had run into a lot of problems with the engine, and um, it wasn't doing what we needed it to do, and um, we weren't getting any support uh, that we felt was reasonable, and it delayed the game massively to the point where we rewrote the whole thing. And it was well, then you know there's a litigation, and it was it was not fun at right. all. Yeah, and that's uh, well, I guess now is as good a time as any to bring that up. Yeah. So um, yeah, July 19, 2007, Silicon Knights sued Epic Games for failure to quote provide a working game engine causing you guys to, quote, experience considerable losses. These are all from the, the suits. Yeah. The suit alleged that Epic was sabotaging Unreal Engine 3 licensees. Silicon Knights lost that lawsuit. Mm. And do you have any regrets for how all that went? And, and as you sit here, you know, years later? Regrets? Well, there's, there's, it's, a funny, it's a funny kind of thing, you know. I, actually, I, you're right. I've never talked about this ever, I don't think. Um, well, I regret we lost. I regret um, that um, it didn't turn out differently. But I don't. I don't know what you can do. You do the best you can with the information that you have, um, and we uh, we faced insurmountable problems, and so did a lot of other developers. And um, you know, the the industry is very. It's a very hard place, and it's a very closed. Uh, it's a very tight knit community. Yeah. And when we did that, it was extremely divisive. And we found out really quickly that people started choosing sides very fast. And uh, that was really tough. The other, thing, the other thing that I underestimated was the amount of uh, time that a lawsuit will take in your mind share is devastating. So it's not, it's not the 
it's not that the, the, the lawsuit didn't have its merits or that we shouldn't have done it. But when I look back now, if I were to realize how much time I would have to put in that versus making games, I would maybe reconsider not doing it. Yeah. And it's not because of the loss. It's more because of the time taken away from making games. So um, it's tough. So anyone thinking about litigating, I would always say to them, uh, be really careful because it's going to take a lot of your time. And as yeah. a matter of fact, it's probably going to take almost all of your time. And then when you even even when you look at X-Men Destiny, um, I was not working on that project a lot near the end, almost at all. And um, uh, so, and I think that way has a toll, and it had a toll on Silicon Knights because I was the main creative force, even though I was the founder of the company. I had other people doing the finances and the business. Mm -hmm. I was the main creator. And then when I get sucked in wholly into a litigation where that's all you're thinking about, it's not being funneled into the creative process, right. which There's, is where I think I'm sure I'm a, a domino effect on the rest of the team there. It strains everyone else, I'm sure. Very hard on the team. And, it's very hard on the team. Yeah. Um, and, um, I, I think some of the one of the worst things when I think about the litigation is, um, you know, myself, like even being a wrestler and like when you wrestle, when you lose, you get beat up. It hurts. So that whole experience, I'm a big believer in life prepares you for things. And I've got some crazy stories sometimes. I don't know if we'll tell it here. We'll see. Um, but life prepares you for things. But what it wasn't prepared, prepared for with, uh, I, I would say the epic litigation was all the damage that it caused around me. So, um, you know, certainly, you know, Silicon Knights was over 200 people, massive job loss, um, huge job loss in Niagara. Um, Niagara is a very small town. There wasn't a lot of high tech there, it was devastating. And um, the impact on the families and uh, all the people that were affected, um, was pretty devastating for me personally. That's the, that was the hardest thing. And that I wish wouldn't happen, but it, but it happened. So like, I think for me, for me, I've been through a lot and I'm like, okay, but that, that, that was a surprise. And that was, uh, wish I could have done better. So I'll ask this follow up with, with, with all due respect. Yeah. You, you got countersued uh -huh. and, and they won. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, are, do you able? Do you either? Are you able to sort of look in the mirror, or or sit down with a psychiatrist, or or whatever sort of works for you? Do you, do you ever kind of look at that and and go, okay, well, boy, if we got countersued and we lost that, mm -hmm. maybe maybe we really were, maybe we really were in the wrong here. Like, what? Where do you kind of? I don't think so. I think. Um, you know, I, I obviously, you know, some people will disagree, but um, you have to really understand how the court systems work. And um, I think um, I think we we were for those people who are in the industry and what happened, uh, we had uh, extremely um, amazing evidence for what we had. And it's the court process itself. Uh, what I became really disillusioned was with the court process and how this stuff works. In in many ways, the justice system, in my opinion, isn't necessarily who's right and wrong. It's it's really who can navigate the system better. Mm -hmm. And you know that's how we really got killed. Um, and um, so, you know, uh, the copyright stuff. You know, it, it was my understanding of it. Uh, uh, from my memory now, and, and which is still pretty good, was there was like a thousand lines potentially of commented of comments, not even of code, that was later deprecated out of three million lines of code. So we're talking like less than a percent that they got that award for, and that's <laughs> that's not a lot of code. So um, and but you know there'll be arguments and there'll be like I don't want to relitigate that or bring that up, but uh, no, it doesn't change my opinion on things at all. Uh, all right, so let's fast forward. You come back a few years later with the aforementioned Shadow of the Eternals, a, a spiritual successor uh, as it was meant to be for, for Eternal Darkness. Yeah. You go with a crowdfunding initiative on that. Mm -hmm. um, what ended up What ended up happening with that? Because as, as I recall it, it was it ended up being taken down and then put back up. I think on another crowdfunding platform. Yeah. So yeah. what what was uh, what was the story behind that? Well, what. We we had game we had gameplay footage and everything like you had yeah. you had stuff you oh, had yeah. a, you had a game there yeah it was looking great we're using the Crytek engine and um, the uh, 
Oh, a lot of things happen. Some stuff I don't even want to talk about. It's so disturbing. Yeah, I know um, what you're... I wasn't going to bring it up, so... We yeah, um, the... Um, I think... I think there was still too much collateral noise around what had just happened with uh, the Epic litigation. Yeah. That there wasn't... The consumer confidence was not in line with what we were building. And what we were building, like, as far as I look back in time... We had something like we had a running demo that people played yeah. at at at, at uh, oh geez what's that Comic Con like we had like four hundred people play that demo so it was solid it was a solid running but it just wasn't enough to get us over the hump of uh, confidence for the consumer then we had a, a bunch of uncontrollable things happen and it was just just didn't happen it was very disappointing. But in some ways, like a lot of things in life, uh, maybe in the end, it's, it's the right thing. Um, I don't know. Um, I love Shadow of the Eternals. And when we started Apocalypse, I looked at it um, and I, we all talked and it was like, this is not the right time for this game. Uh, there's still too much baggage with it. Yeah. And uh, so we moved on. But um, yeah, it was really tough. Very, very hard. We worked on that. I'd say everyone in the company worked on that game for a year uh, just on their own dime and uh, wow. yeah, never never came to fruition, unfortunately. We tried. So now we fast forward. The game uh, behind me here on the big screen <clears throat> is Dead House Sonata. Mm. For those in the audience not familiar with it, give us the elevator pitch. What is this thing? Dead House Sonata is a uh, free-to-play game where uh, you play the undead fighting the living. And I you, like it already. Do you? Oh, I do. thanks. Um, Flip the script a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We. Um, I'm going back to my roots with this game, and going back to the roots of what I was talking about earlier. Earlier with Legacy of Cain. Yeah. And not from a perspective of we're going to try to remake, you know, Legacy of Cain. Though I think there's certainly uh, there the Legacy of Cain community could really need some love in that direction, and uh, so we're going to try to provide that. But Really, when you talk about the medium, we're taking today's medium, which is wholly different from back when we were on the PlayStation 1. So today's medium is uh, multiplayer. And uh, a lot of people say watching more, watching games more than they're playing. So if you look at Twitch as an example, sure. you have uh, more people watching a League of Legends game than are watching the Super Bowl. So you have a lot of people watching as they're working and stuff. So imagine if we integrate this medium into a game and take that medium and take advantage of it. That's what we're trying to do with Deadhouse Sonata. And we're trying to do story that really pretty much is ignored with multiplayer games. So we want to take a narrative approach to this. And at the same time, we want to integrate storytelling into this medium where the audience can participate. Imagine back in the day when you're Sitting in a Greek play 2,000 years ago, you actually had agency where you could say if a, that's where a thumbs up, thumbs down comes from. Yeah. If, if, a, if a character would live or die, the audience could participate in that and then the, the, the actors would take it from there. With Twitch and these new mediums that we have where we have audience participation, imagine making a game around that medium. That's what Dead House Sonata is about. Boy, I think, you, you, I think you're probably the first person ever to equate Twitch to old Greek plays, and I like it. That, is, like that it? is a cool analogy. I like that. Oh, thanks. Um, so that is, when you look at our love for uh, the medium, and for me, it's always the medium. What can we do? We want to change the way people think about playing games, and this is uh, this is our foray, foray into it. And in many ways, I'm a different person. I'm literally, this is a story of characters coming back from the dead, and I'm coming back from the dead, so there's always gonna be a little bit of part of me in there, and I'm a changed person. I, I'm not, I'm very similar in many ways, but in many ways, all the things that we went through with Precursor, with the epic litigation, yeah. um, the, uh, I think, I think now my perspective and where we're going with this story is really going to resonate. And all my experiences, all the fantastic highs that I talked about of hanging out with Kojima-san and Miyamoto-san and Iwata-san, uh, seeing Silicon Knights get destroyed by the litigation, uh, trying to you know have a, a few false starts like with Precursor and Shadow of the Eternals, has brought in 
me here to do Dead House, I, I feel very, I, f I feel fairly confidently that Silicon Knights could not have done Dead House because they're, it's such a different medium. Uh, we have people at Apocalypse that are like Diamond League of Legends players. Yeah. And, um, you know, the people at Silicon Knights were awesome and they had like 25 to 30 years of experience, but I don't think I still keep in contact with a lot of my friends. They're not playing League of Legends. Yeah. You know, so the mediums have changed so much. Bringing in these people and doing what we're doing with this is something that inspires me. And when I go on to do something and we're trying to do something, we're trying to really make a difference in the industry. And I think that I think that with what we're doing with Dead House Sonata is going to be very different. And there's going to be, you know, a lot of things that people know from our games they can come to expect, but it's going to be free to play, which is, hey, it's it's greenfield for me. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in it, that's for sure. But I think the free to play games give people an opportunity to try something before they invest any kind of financial uh, investment. All and they don't never have to yeah. if they don't want to. So um, it'll be interesting. It's funny that you've been talking about the, the medium and the medium being the message and that being almost a mantra for you. Because now that I, just even over the course of this conversation, you know, you've gone from, you've really actually lived that. You've gone That's from right. probably what the th three and a three and a, a half inch floppy disks to to cart, you know, cartridges and CD ROMs, and now yeah. you know the the internet and and you know persistent connectivity. You know, it's I think is very astute and. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Dr. Barry Grant. We were talking about, you know, how each sort of he would he's in he really talks about film theory and different directors and the auteur theory and what are the different techniques of Alfred Hitchcock, say, uh, compared to other directors. Alfred Hitchcock going to be one of my favorites. And we sat down one day, and he we were talking, and he said to me, "Well, what's your thing?" And I, I sat back and I'm like, "I don't know if I know." And and then we started talking, and then we got to the point where it's like, I think it's studying the medium. The medium for me is what I bring to the table as a director and as a creator, and not everyone thinks that way, and and that's okay. It's not there's no right or wrong thing, but um, I'm hopeful, um, you know, because for the longest time, and you know, you said it earlier in the interview, I've said some things that really make people angry, like cloud computing in like 2006, where I think it's going to be the future, and um, you know, those kind of things are. I realize, and they res it's because I'm thinking about the medium all the time, and what can this medium do? And when I first got pulled into that whirlpool, going all the way back to Richard Garriott, the medium did it for me. It was like, yeah. this medium is different than reading all the fantasy books that I used to read, watching all the movies, and to me, that's where the power of this entertainment lies, and that's what excites me, and that's that's what I want to make as that's what I want to play and what I want to consume. I would love to imagine you're playing this revenant in this, and you're trying to get through the world and understand your story and the decisions that you make help build your character. But what if what if the world around you, all the players who are watching you on Twitch are also making a difference on your character. <laughs> Isn't that a cool experience? That'd be cool. Would, wouldn't that be something that people would want to play? I know it's something that I would want, and it's in some sense, it's like real life. It's not only going back to the Greek plays, but it resonates with our world today. There are some things that are absolutely out of our control that define our characters, right? That you, we all go through, like life is hard, and there are some things that you can't control. Well, what if we make a game experience that works in that way? And that's what we're trying to do with that house. Well, you talk about you know, getting people in there all right dead house is free to play <clears throat> but how do you get it out how do you get people to even try your game in this day and age where there's even though the digital marketplaces are bursting at the seams even you know they're sort of curated but like yeah how do you even break through the noise now yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. You don't know. have that Nintendo seal of approval that only you right. know, a handful of games get to get on the shelf anymore. Right. There's certainly, certainly, you know, some people would say marketing spend. But I think um, the old traditional ways of marketing your products um, are becoming less and less effective every day. And I think um, we're trying some things. What's really... So you were asking me, you know, before... Um, you know, how do you know if a game's gonna be good all the way back from Legacy of Kane? And when we were doing Legacy of Kane, some of the things we were doing, people were just like, well, I've never seen that before. Or with the two human demo that got us with Nintendo and the seamless cinemas. Uh, though people had just started seeing it, it was it was pretty novel. And 
I think that's what's starting to happen in the game space when it comes to getting out there in the marketplace. Um, I don't, I don't know is the answer. I don't know if anyone knows. I know we're starting to hear things like performance marketing, which was a fairly new term to me. And what that means is you see what works and what doesn't, and you follow the leads, And but it's all based upon metrics and clicks. and right. That's all data, right? <laughs> so I think that's one of the ways. Um, I, think, I think with what we're doing, we're huge believers in community interaction. And uh, even back when, I don't know if you remember this, but Man, I used to post on the IGN forums for Eternal Darkness, and gamers would really respond. And I try to answer. Back in those days, it was really hard when you're in crunch mode to get feedback from the forums and actually implement that into your game is super hard. Yeah. However, with these games, if we release an early alpha, a closed alpha, and people say, we really like this, this sucks, change this, this is horrible. What you can iterate your game and work with gamers to create the game that they want to create, and I think that is so powerful. I think that's going to dominate the industry, and I think it's starting to show now. I think you're starting to see free-to-play games now. Clearly, with some of the big games where they're dominating, but I think you're going to not only see dominance in the sales, but you're going to see dominance in the quality of product because of the way the model is. Right. The fact that we have an opportunity to interact with gamers, and again, I think we work for gamers. I like. I think that is something that you cannot move away from, and I think you guys espouse to the same thing. You work for your consumers. You want to get them the news. You mm -hmm. want to show them the products that they want to see, and and you work for consumers too. And I think you always must stay consumer focused because um, without without gamers and game fans saying that they like Legacy of Kane or they like Eternal Darkness, what good is it? What what, ser what does it service? It services nothing. So my job is to entertain and hopefully bring people to a place where they have memorable experiences and can escape life. And uh, that's why I think these new models are so exciting. And but I, I don't pretend to know the answer <laughs> beyond what I've said. So well, uh, what do you what do you hope that your legacy is in this industry one day after you've retired and however many years from now? Yeah, uh, I, I hope people remember my games for trying new things and making a difference in the industry. Um, I know um, I was talking to a lot of people about this, um, especially um, when you're going through good times, <laughs> you get lots of friends. And when you're going through bad times, that's when, when you're going through the tough times is you realize where your true friends are um, because they'll still talk to you and, and not, not, not look at you like you have leprosy and stuff. And those when I started asking those questions like, was this a good game? Why did this happen? Like, was, did, and did, was this, why did this game resonate? And why did people like this game and not this game as much? And what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And in the end, uh, another, another friend, another academic of mine uh, said to me, uh, Do Dr. Jeff Howard, he's like, when we were talking about Too Human at the time and all the research that we did into Norse mythology and how that resonated with people. Still have a lot of gamers coming up to me saying, Dennis, I love the story in Too Human, would love to see a sequel. And surprisingly, a lot of people don't know this, Too Human sold a million copies. Did much better than what the perception is. And which is crazy, right? People are like, oh, that game didn't do that well. No, that game actually did pretty well. Was Microsoft mad about, about all that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I have to ask them. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to speak for Microsoft. <laughs> um, but it was one of their best-selling games that year. And um, But he said to me that it's the story that will be remembered. It's the work that will be remembered. And um, that, that helped me a lot. And I think, um, you know, when you look at your body of work, you hope that it's remembered for the good things and for the things that you contributed. And I hope that people see that we tried to do something different. And a lot of the stuff comes from the heart. Like even the sanity system, uh, I'm sure a lot of gamers have heard the story before, but I was really frustrated to hear about the movement uh, about violence in video games, video games causing people to become violent. There was no evidence for it. So, and I was on the committees doing, looking at some of the research uh, for the IGDA and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And I just got so frustrated. I was like, well, people think we're messing with their heads. Let's try. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And that's where that spawned from, out of my emotional uh, frustration with yeah. what was happening in the real world. So, um, and in many ways, Dead House Sonata, I, I feel I'm coming back from the dead. So you're going to get that piece of me. 
and uh, hopefully it'll resonate well with people. Um, so yeah, that's what I hope gets remembered. All right, well, Dead House Sonata, the new game, the free-to-play action RPG, fair to call? Yeah, action RPG, multiplayer, yes. and we've got one thing I want to talk about if it's okay. Please. Um, I've got a cat shirt on. Yes. Um, and we, uh, with, uh, as, we are, oh, as we're at store will be open by now, we have an adopt a cat drive. So if you adopt a cat and show that you've adopted a cat, we'll give you twice the amount of in-game currency. So we That's have, great. Yeah, we have three uh, adopted cats in the studio. Um, this this guy kind of looks like Lord Cheeseburger, and we adopted three cats. We 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 went into the Humane Society. We said because we knew we could take probably three cats. It's a it's a big office, and I said uh, give us two cats or give us some cats that no one will adopt. So we got a couple cats that couldn't be separated. They were brother and sister. Yeah. They were seven years old uh, and pre pretty overweight. So that means there'll be some medical problems with them. And I thought, okay, so we adopted them. And that's Lord Cheeseburger and Callie. And then we got another little kitten. I was like, okay, this little kitten will keep them active. And maybe we'll start to you know, reinvigorate them. And people looking at me say, Dennis, you're probably not the best person for advice on weight loss. And I would agree. Um, and <laughs> so we got this little kitten, Rev, and it went the wrong way. So now he's getting a little tubby. And, uh, but if you adopt a cat, we love you for it. And uh, we will reward you with our, uh, in our in-game store and our currency and stuff. So check it out. I love that. That's great stuff. Thank you. Uh, what website? Give a quick plug for the website. Yeah, buydeadhouse.com. Buy-deadhouse.com. Perfect. Deadhouse Sonata will be keeping a close eye on it here at IGN. Uh, Dennis Dyack, thank you so much. This was a real treat to, to take a walk through your, again, as you, as you said, just what a roller coaster of a career just yeah. a, a lot of great stories and yeah really looking forward to seeing uh seeing how how uh how you've been spending your time the last couple of years with with dead house and out of here so uh for more from the best brightest most interesting minds in the games industry i've got new episodes of ign unfiltered every month there's 40 something of them on ign youtube or your favorite podcast service so if you've enjoyed this We've got uh, interviews with plenty of other folks. Check those out. Uh, Dennis, thanks again. My pleasure. And we'll see you next month. Thank you.